And I'm going to mute everyone. So Claire, if you would unmute yourself, that would be great. Well, welcome, uh, Claire, to the Twin Cities uh, mm -hmm. on a very, very beautiful afternoon in St. Paul. And actually, Doug and his wife are in Des Moines. So uh, you're, you're, in, you're in several cities virtually. We're, we're thrilled to have you join us. As I said, I've been a, a fan of your wines for a long time, and I'm excited to taste them with you and get to know you a little bit. Um, I, I guess the, well, no one, it's probably not necessary, but I'd encourage everyone to pour themselves a glass of the Sauvignon Blanc as we get started. If you agree that we should taste the Sauvignon Blanc first, Claire. Yep, that's a good idea. Yeah. So if you, if we could start with, tell us, New Zealand is such an, a romantic place. It has a, the reputation kind of, of being the most beautiful place in the world and the most, the best quality of life in the world. And um, of course there's those, the hobbits that are running around everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and, Keep an uh, eye out for them. Yeah, and the chooks. Um, but talk, could you just talk to us a little bit about New Zealand in general, about what makes it so unique and special in terms of a wine region, because the wines really are so different from, you know, the same grape variety anywhere else. Uh, I, I think this combination of factors, but it's a long, thin series of islands. Um, so we're down in the, in, almost on the edge of the Antarctic Ocean, so to speak. So we have very cold water that's pushed up from the Antarctic. And, um, and it pushes up against New Zealand and rises to the surface on um, on both coasts, but particularly on the on the east coast, and so we have really cold water, and then uh, that affects that affects the whole climate of the country because it, it um, creates this maritime influence, and so we have really cold nights, and we can have hot days. So you've got this extreme combination of um, of of um, microclimate behavior that grows through, throughout, particularly on the east coast where it's dry, um, it grows a, a wonderful array of fruit and you have extraordinary stone fruit and um, pip fruit and grapes, of course, throughout various parts of the east coast of the whole country. And uh, even out on the East Islands, like up in Auckland, up on an island off Auckland grows the most amazing, it's probably one of the places that you do get Cabernet Sauvignon truly ripe in New Zealand. So um, I guess it's the sea to mountain and a little bit of land in between influence that is so extreme. We have a lot of wind because you have the movement of the pressure, high pressure to low pressure because you have that cold sea and the earth and the and the and the the earth warms up, and so you have constant movement of air from one way to the other. And um, but really, here in Marlborough, we have an extraordinary climate because we are uh, surrounded by so much sea, and we can have what we would call, oh, I suppose, in in um, Fahrenheit, we would have can have an eighty degree day that can go down to a 40 to 41 degree night in the middle of summer. So quite extreme. And, and, and for us, a normal summer night would be around uh, 48, 50 would be not uncommon. And a normal summer day could be anywhere from 75 to, to 90. 90 is hot for us, but um, so, and it's, and it's dry and it's windy. And so you reasonably control disease. Um, we do have a huge water catchment. So we have access to a lot of water if we need it. And um, all of those things 
are part of the extraordinary flavor of um, grapes and many, many things that we grow here, like the, uh, we have the, those beautiful passion fruit hops. I've forgotten what the methoxypyrazine hops. Um, I think if you're a, a boutique brewery, a boutique beer brewer, the New Zealand Nelson hops and the Tasmanian hops, it's all the same thing. That's something about all, you've got this influence of the sea, this extreme climate variation, which you don't get in a big landmass. You just don't. You get a continental climate, which is, you know, during the summer, it might only be um, sort of 68 degrees during the day. It's probably about 60 degrees at night. You just don't get that variation. And um, there's only a couple of spots in New Zealand where we have a big enough land surface to get, get any concept of continental behavior. So that's just briefly the, geo, you know, the, the reasons why the grapes retain their acidity and their minerality, and yet they ripen because that seems to be so hard to do. You often can have, um, to retain that level of acidity, it's often you really struggle with those ripe, bright fruit flavors. They can be very steely and not very expressive. Uh, and that's probably a sunshine, a lack of sunshine. Um, but here in Marlborough, we have massive amounts of sunshine, but not necessarily hot temperatures um, and cold nights. So I could go on, I could go on. I don't know how familiar you are with looking at New Zealand on the map, but um, just through this, the fact that the islands, uh, we stretch over such a long distance, we go from extremely chilly down in the south into subtropical up the top. And, um, but the sea has such a paramount influence over every aspect of our climate. Well, that, that, that uh, idea of warm days and cool or cold nights is a common thread in all these conversations that we've had that um, this diet, this idea of diurnal temperature shifts, uh, yes. you know, creates ripe grapes, but, but balancing acidity in over and over and over again, we've heard wine, winemakers talk about that as being a, a factor in their wines because you have the grape, you need the grapes to be ripe but you also need to have some balance, balancing acidity too in that, right? That I think that. that's right. And I think what uh, in other parts of the world, people have to find these little, little spot locations within, within areas, whether it be, you know, um, there'll be a valley and then they have to go up the side of the valley to find that kind of behavior. Um, whereas here it's kind of, it's just, it's just a universal character. And um, the, the land mass is just not wide enough to not be influenced by the sea. So here, I guess the flavors of Sauvignon Blanc throughout the Marlborough region is distinctly affected by the soil type because there's a similarity with the um, diurnal change. And so the, the Sauvignon Blanc that we have here uh, on the river terraces has got a lot more of that tropical fruit, soft, quite um, uh, soft passion fruit, grapefruit, a um, bit of guava, occasionally some floral elderflower aspects and quite um, smooth um, and a lot of minerality, a little lime pith on the palate. Whereas uh, you go closer towards the sea, which is like the real alluvial fan of the valley from the river and that's area that used to grow a lot of vegetables. And now the grapes that grow down there have a huge amount of what you call thiols, a really, really intensely overpoweringly aromatic, sometimes a little bit sweaty, um, but an extreme aroma and sometimes a hint of bitterness, you know, or a hint of, yeah, kind of slight bitterness or stringent or something on the palate that is, kind of hard like a really hard lime flavor and um, so that takes a bit of balancing but it's that very powerful nose and that's just purely the soil it's got so much nitrogen in it it kicks off a whole lot of those flavor profiles and flavonoids and then you go over to the southern side of the valley where it's clay and there it's great this great sort of area where a lot of pinot is grown but for Sauvignon Blanc it's lovely there but it's very lemony and simple 
and it's nice you can do some nice leaves aging and things like that but it's never a very expressive fruity wine it's because uh, of the clay it's the soil is a little colder uh, it's always tends to be slightly moist on some level and it just doesn't seem to express the sunlight influence of that that we get in the rest of the valley so that they're all very interesting components and um within the valleys there's sub flavor areas as well and so it's been fascinating looking at those developments across um across time because everywhere in the valley it's a beautiful distinctive flavor and um it's just that some are more overt areas than others so there's really nowhere bad there's nowhere to to, to not be successful at growing Sauvignon Blanc in the whole Marlborough region. And that's unusual. You can't sort of go to say California and say, well, you can grow Cabernet everywhere. And it's all amazing. It just depends what flavor you're looking for. Or you can't, you know, it's, um, you go to say the Loire Sancerre and you generally are getting from each vintage one kind of flavor from the whole area. And I think that's partly why Marlborough is so dynamic and it does that to everything that it grows. You know, the Pinot Noirs have particular flavors from certain valleys and certain sites. And it's all kind of responding to, um, I guess, differences in soil and micro differences in the um, climate effective but are hugely influenced here by the soil because the climate is it's not that bigger area and it's all relatively the same a little bit area places on the south tend to be a little bit cooler and by the river a little bit warmer but um, that's that's the intriguing side about Marlborough some varieties just therefore don't work here at all you know it's like it's you try and grow Cabernet here it's it's been grown and it seems to be really nice about 14 years in the bottle where all those green flavors have kind of melded into something a little bit more salty and briny. But otherwise it's got a lot of tomato leaf and capsicum, which is, no one likes that, <laughs> and Cabernet Sauvignon. So, you know, it's like a, it's the region where it's a success or it's a bit of a fail across the whole place. And that's what's so interesting about it. And it it really suits things like Gewürztraminer and Pinot Gris and Grüner Veltliner. Um, and um, whereas you can grow Syrah here, but in specific sites and only tiny, you know, they really are small little spots in Malbec and small little spots, it's not generic. Um, things like Cabernet Franc have always been a bit of a fail. Uh, so Chenin Blanc, for some reason, that may just be clonal, have, has not worked very well here. Um, it's, there are some varieties that just have not done well. And of course, then others that just go everywhere and, and are magnificent. Well, I would say that the only reason anyone would plant Cabernet Sauvignon in Marlborough is greed. Greed. Because they think they can sell Cabernet Sauvignon for more than they can sell Sauvignon Blanc. Well, they'd grow, they, they, they planted it here. They possibly expect to make better Cabernet Sauvignon in Marlborough than they can make Sauvignon Blanc in Marlborough. Uh, yes, Cabernet Sauvignon was planted in the beginning, um, remembering that commercially the first, first um, grapes, I believe, were planted in 75. And initially they planted, oh, you know, the usual suspects, Muller Thurgar, Riesling Sylvana, Chasselas. It depended where things came from. And then, and there was a, a real pull out quite rapidly because the philosopher came in then as well. And, um, and then the, the, you know, the more noble varieties were planted uh, in the 80s and 90s. And so there was an awful lot of uh, misplantings and, and vines planted completely you know, wrong root stocks, wrong um, own, root, own roots wrong varieties, wrong clones, because within Cabernet Sauvignon, you can have clones that will always be green and clones that will be happy to ripen. So, um, you know, properly selected material. And there were some, there were some um, very epic 
disastrous plantings that really didn't suit the land, didn't suit the region and etc. And people did make wine for them for a while, but in persistence, because a lot of people believed that there are massive sunshine hours, we could grow the Bordeaux varieties. They didn't understand the diurnal behavior. They didn't understand that you need to have warm nights and warm days. Yeah. And um, otherwise that, that Cabernet will, you know, the Cabernet Franc will stay sort of furry and slightly wet sappy and the Cab Sav will just maintain its strange capsicum character. <laughs> right. um, how did you become to be, how did you come to be the winemaker at uh, Ouya? What's your background? So um, I uh, went and studied wine in Australia in the 80s and worked over there a little bit and then came back to New Zealand in the end of 89 um, and got a job with Corbin's, which um, was a, a long standing, one of the early New Zealand wine companies uh, started up around Auckland. And um, a lot of our wine industry came in with the, um, with the, um, uh, Dalmatian uh, gum diggers and Yugoslavs, etc., uh, Croatia, and then came in. These guys came in. They were from Lebanon, and they branched through New Zealand in the eighties. Really looking, looking, looking at the you know burgeoning white wine. The whole explosion of New Zealand being a great place to make wine was just sort of happening. And um, so I started working with them. And then after a couple of years, went into a large uh, contract facility because New Zealand by that stage was, you know, Cloudy Bay had come out with their um, Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, there was so much dynamic interest at that point. I think um, in 91, Berth Clicquot bought 70% of Cloudy Bay. You know, the focus was Initially, when we came back, it was sparkling wine and Sauvignon Blanc, and then just the whole expressive nature of Sauvignon Blanc really stepped forward. And um, so uh, in 91, I did a stage at Tappenjay, uh, one of the very early foreigners. And, um, and then in, uh, and in 92, I also started a wine company called Lawson's Dry Hills, which uh, for Ross and Barbara and was their initial winemaker to 76 when I um, left there, uh, sorry, 96. Um, and when I left there rather round with my first child and, um, and we started Huia, which is where we are now, yes. So I am, I'm sort of fully involved in, I guess, all aspects of the winemaking here and um, and the viticulture. So it's kind of more of an overseeing role at this stage. Did you ever meet have, Pierre? Did you ever meet Pierre Emmanuel Tattinger? Uh The big cheese? Yeah. Um, no, no, I was a I was in the winery. Um, I was in the winery proper in Hrem and um, but went did a lot of um, Monsieur Dupont. Uh, did a lot of wandering around with the chief winemaker uh, around the region, and um, stayed out at the chateau, and just had more of a. I'm not such a head honcho experience. More of a, a head winemakery honcho experience. Well, he uh, Pierre Emmanuel Tadinger once uh, invited my wife up to his hotel room in front of me. And I think he was actually surprised when she said no. Uh, so he was, he was the, he was the very French. <laughs> yes, he, he is very confident in his uh, sexiness, let's say. <laughs> he, he had no qualms about ask, it, make, making a pass at my wife in front of me. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I honestly believe he was really surprised when she said no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I have I have a hard time enjoying Tattinger, Tattinger champagne uh, as a result of that. Um, so you yeah. mentioned Cloudy Bay, and th this is this is I think an interesting question. Cloudy Bay came on the scene, and all of a sudden there was this wine called Cloudy Bay Sauvignon Blanc, 
And it was an absolute sensation. It was a revelation. Nobody had ever tasted anything like it. Um, and it became the enormous success that it was and Pico bought into it. And, and then wines like Kim Crawford came along that were also sensations, you know, sensationally uh, successful. And now there's, well, so much uh, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc. So my question is, 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 is Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc a terroir driven wine? Is it, is, is Tuya Sauvignon Blanc, Cloudy Bay Sauvignon Blanc, all, you know, whoever, is, 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 is the characteristic of Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc driven by the place and the grapes, the terroir, or is it driven by the commercial success of wines like Cloudy Bay and the desire to imitate those because they will, they, an imitator will also be very successful. Is, does that question make sense to you? Absolutely, no, it's a very, it's a very, very pertinent question. So there are, there are a wineries here that are to, to our driven, um, us being one of them. And then you have, the thing about the success of Sauvignon Blanc was it has brought in a different level of winemaking from the normal New Zealand winemaking. Um, you know, Verve Clico owned Cloudy Bay. In fact, LVMH now run Cloudy Bay. So when they stepped in between Verve and um, when they took over from Verve, um, production became a primary objective, you know. And um, when Gallo got involved with Whitehaven, it took them from a very small wine company to a massive, now in a massive expansion as we speak, the constellation when they bought Kim Crawford, you know, Kim Crawford's a guy. And um, when they bought Kim Crawford, uh, that just completely changed everything. And um, all of those wines and like um, Perno Ricard, you know, it, when Montana sold, it was a hostile takeover. The guy, Mogic, I can't remember his name, he, they had no, they, that family had no intention of selling. It's just they'd been persuaded to go on the share market and there was a, it was a series of aggressive hostile takeovers that happened through um, buying off the shareholders. I think it was Allied Domecq and then some, and then um, Perno Ricard now have it. And, so that whole face of the New Zealand wine industry, it's all Marlborough based, has is, is changed it dramatically because that's who you see. That's who you see out there. And, um, and then that's brought in those kind of people into the valley and they weren't here. When it started, it wasn't like that at all. It was New Zealand and, um, you know, I, Montana was a, a family wine company. Um, Corbin's was a family wine company. Corbin's actually bought... Um, Montana bought Corbin's. Um, a lot of these, they've started off as family wine companies that, um, and it's a two-sided thing. There's, there's a, we, we have very, we have no secondary lenders here and we have a egalitarian society where it's really hard to make any decent money. And when you do, you often end up being, going to live, living somewhere else or living in many parts of the world. Um, and it's usually because you've sold your company out, you have to seem to have to be, to get any size, you need to sell yourself, you need to access funds to grow. And then once you do that, you're into the global marketplace. So it's very hard. You tend to have small business here, you know, 90 something percent of New Zealand businesses employ five people. Um, it's, so then you have the corporations, which are the wines you see and a lot of the sub brands the brands that have no home um, they're just labels they can be um, there's trading of course trading in there and they're not to our base they're just bulk wine based um, and it's um, it's what a lot of what you see 
and certainly at any discounted at any you know ten dollars they are wines that really don't have a home and they they have no tua and they are just volume produced off vineyards and squished through big contract winemaking facilities and have a label put on them and that's that's an aspect of the industry that is um, this year we have no fruit you know basically there's such a chronic shortage so you you're going to have a real diminishment of that um, but it is um, it's changed the face of the industry because it's what's visible to the international market but there's a whole lot of us here who's still here and we're still selling wine all over the place and we're still very much you know single vineyard or terroir based these guys they take a bit of this and a bit of that and they try and make the blend the same every year and you know that can be very good wine but it's um it's to a recipe and absolutely to a recipe and um like Pernod Ricard for years they they like to hire um food techs you know um because winemakers are difficult <laughs> um because, because they need they need to follow a recipe and why are you recipe. difficult of course not but i am um, i'm not very good at following a recipe you know yeah. we one of the last events <laughs> we had in this room before covid was with erica crawford ah with, yes from with love block with her love block yep. wines yeah and those they're nice wines yeah you know, she's nice. great uh, yeah. but you know when, when there are wineries like kim crawford there are others there's lots of these wineries like Silver Oak and, um, well, I'll just mention those two and I won't make any more enemies than I need to make. But there are wineries like Kim Crawford that when, so, sometimes if you're in my end of the wine business, you have to learn to bite your tongue because when someone, I hear this, I mean, frequently when people say, my favorite white wine in the world is Kim Crawford Sauvignon Blanc. And, my honest reaction would be, have you actually tasted, do you actually pay attention when you taste Kim Crawford Sauvignon Blanc today relative to what you tasted when the Crawfords were making the wines? Because they're not remotely the same wines. Yeah, and exactly so right. they're, they're, you know, they're just, they're just riding on the coattails. It's just reputation. There's a lot of wineries like that. It's just reputation. And it seems like a lot of times the, the, the buyer doesn't really pay attention to what the wine tastes like. Actually well, tastes like. That's right. That's the brand. That's the brand push. And, um, and that's what we uh, always, you know, that's, that's, you go to a buyer, they say, well, we, all, we have this, there's a whole lot of people buy Kim Crawford. You know, it's like people buy um, Coca-Cola or Pepsi. You're talking, it's just a brand. And, um, and it's, a lot, it's a long way from when Kim, you know, there's technology now involved in that big winemaking is, is, quite, is quite complex. It's, it's, um, it's very much like food technology. It's very much more like why your cheese, why your block of cheese uh, doesn't go off for months and months. You're into, into that realm with the big, with the big um, with systems based winemaking. So if you want to look for, you know, healthier wine to be honest you just need to go small where people are doing what people have been people are making growing the grapes and making the wine like they have been for centuries and you know once you get into that world you start walking into the i mean the the organic biodynamic world is exactly what's been going on for centuries but um within new zealand we have a we've just started this um with the last few years this um Appalachian, um, Appalachian wine, Marlborough, um, and it is Marlborough wine growers, and it's really um, that's just putting a limit on yield, and it has to be a hundred percent Marlborough, and um, so for that hundred percent Marlborough, that's massive. It has to be bottled in New Zealand. So those wines with the logo, I might have a logo. I'm not sure. Sorry, I'll just give it. See this logo, yeah, yeah, go Izzy, you got it there. Um, that that logo there 
it's really hard to see. We'll go right up, right up. Anyway, that's that is means that we are a member. That means that even anything with that bottle, it has that bottle has been bottled in New Zealand, Good and evening. it's a and it's 100% uh, Marlborough. Claire, I'm going to pause this for just a second. I've got I've got to step away, I think, for a minute. If you'll hold, bear with me for yep. just a second. Oh, that... uh, well, I hope you said something really, really fascinating while I was gone. I'm sure right, you did. I did my, I did my best. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, I, I think, for, I think, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is like one of the most polarizing wines in the world. People, there's a group of people that just love it more than anything. And there's a group of people that just detest it more than anything. And there's really hardly anybody in between. And I think that the people that really detest it, detest it because of wines like what Ken Crawford is now. Mm -hmm. And the people who love it, love it because of wines like yours, Craggy Range, other people, well, Lovelock, Eric Crawford, Lovelock, make really lovely wines. And, but, 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 you know, the, the, what, those, those giant bulk producers that you mentioned, they all taste exactly alike. There's no, there's no specialness to those wines. I think it's very hard to make special wines when you're making millions of liters. You know, yeah. you, you, you're, you're creating a, a, a generic blend just by the, by the vastness of your supply base, and um, and it is it is a concept of a, a blend, like say you know Oyster Bay, um, when it's bottling time, you know, the call goes out to the regions, and the wine comes goes into Auckland, and you know from everywhere, and gets blended and bottled and on a boat. It's incredibly efficient, um, but it's just the it's just mo moving everything into that product. Uh, concept of of production, and um, and that's one aspect of the wine industry, which is everywhere. And then, um, but here in Marlborough, there's also a, a another complete side. There's a whole lot of very terroir based wineries and wine production, and um, as well alongside of those uh, kind of beer moths. Um, so talk to us a little bit about the Sauvignon Blanc, this, this terrific Sauvignon Blanc, which is so, unusual. Yeah, you're on the 2020, aren't you? Yes. Yep, yep. So here we have the 2020. We are located very close to the river. We're on sandy river, um, river soils, very um, recent alluvial soils. With a lot of rocks and so the here because of the climate it's a little bit warmer at night because we're by the river than say over on the southern side of the valley and these vines the first they were planted in 1994 and 1995 and then 2000 and so they have been um, in the ground for a while so they have more of that nice depth of flavor of guava on the mid palate so we we uh, pick these and um, ferment. We ferment around 60% of this went through ferment in um, maturation of ferment in neutral French oak. And that just adds another kind of richness, uh, creaminess to the mid palate because these, this vineyard, it's certified organic. We practice biodynamics on it as well, just to add more energy back into, into the environment. And um, we seem to be getting these very, very low pHs. So it creates a real minerality to the wine. And um, it has a crispness, a minerality, but lots of lovely sort of golden flavors, as well as that lime citrus. With, that, with the natural viticulture, we tend to get more um, aromatic florals, a little bit of elderflower, maybe a bit of white flower in there as well. And so the wine itself is um, fresh, crisp, but with lots and lots of layers of many different flavors. The very ones you're talking about, the, the large blends, they tend to have one, you know, they're using a lot of aromatic yeast and enzymatic flavor enhancers. So they're very dominated by the nose and the front palate, very, very much so. And um, 
the back the back of the palate, mid, mid and back can be quite short and they're not so good for aging, whereas these wines age beautifully. Um, and they're lovely with the, the this they're lovely the Sauvignon Blanc is lovely with food. So you have this with um, any uh, prawns or any oysters or mussels or any of the um, shellfish and it's just lovely beautiful combination where the wine steps up and so does so do those foods and um, it's more of a well it's a wine you can sip of course and but it's lovely with a meal as well so that's the idea with the hui range is they're very much in, for cons they're not they're not show wines they're very much for what you want to sit down and actually drink, whether you be eating some, um, you know, roasted almonds or um, or oysters, yeah. It says on your website that um, I want to ask you about the website here in a minute. But the it says on your website that your biodynamic practices prepare the vines for adversity, prepare the vineyards for adversity. That's another common thread that we've heard among uh, winemakers who practice biodynamic, either certified or not, um, that it just engenders a healthier, a, a vineyard as an organism, a vineyard as, a, as, a, as, a, as an organism that is more prepared to deal with drought or whatever vagaries come along because of mother nature. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So, <clears throat> I, I guess with with um, organics as a prescribed, uh, you know, you you don't have anything. There's nothing on our vineyards that is um, no pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, anything like that. Nothing like that is sprayed on the vineyard, and um, any fertilizer is uh, is not it's not held in the crystal. It's not held in the salt. Um, you know, we'll be putting fish, we put fish meal and, and lime, etc. that sort of thing in. Um, and so say we need some lime with some uh, magnesium in it, there's uh, lime works that have that or lime with a bit of um, uh, sulfur, there are lime works that have it or there's lime works where you have just pure lime. And so you work with it instead of just getting a lime and then adding something as a outside, you actually find a source where, which is it's all available. The science is well and truly there. You just, you know, um, think a little bit, uh, yeah, more individually, I guess. And um, so, I guess with the biodynamic thing is that you then look at what you can add back to the soil. So you're trying to add energy back. So you, you know, you use some of the preps to make your compost, and they just help. Um, add more, I guess, more um, ingredients into your compost that you're then adding back to your vines. Um, tend to have more of a interest in your vines, keep an eye on how they're behaving. It's a monoculture. And, you know, a monoculture is always inclined to have a plague. So, you, have, you know, you'd be trying to create diversity in the vineyard so that we don't it's basically you haven't got an agar plate just sticking out there waiting for the next marauder to come along and and uh, and and um, overwhelm and so we're trying to create a dynamic um, if you like a, di a dynamic diversity out there of predators and um, and and those that will be eaten and so uh, that in itself creates a healthy ecosystem Unclaude Laflave at Domain Laflave told me once that five years after she converted to biodynamic winemaking, which she was one of the pioneers of, one of the things she noticed that she hadn't anticipated was that her workers were happier. That's of that's that's so we found that so quickly. You see, you can walk out out here and you can pick. Um, a grape and eat it and there's nothing on it there's no withholding period there's no metallic flavors you can you work you work in the vines and you're not um you're not saying okay you can't go and work out there because we just put pesticide on or we just put a fungicide on and and you know um there's none of that happening it's there's a lot of it's it's so different you go to so there's a lot of there's a lot of glyphosate a lot of people here you know we um, undervine weed spray and there's still a reasonable amount of conventional 
grape growing here. And it's always a desert, you know, there's, it's lifeless because the idea is to grow grapes and everything else is basically a potential competition. The con that's the concept. So you're, you're, as a human, you're working in a kind of natural desert and, um, and it actually people would much prefer to work in a living environment where there's insects around them. <clears throat> there's flowers on the ground as well as, um, you know, just one species of grass. Mm. And um, there'd be birds around and they're not punished for being birds um, because mm. essentially most of the birds want to eat seeds anyway. So, and they're trees in the vineyard. Um, they're not seen as uh, carriers of, um, of insects that uh, predate on the vines. You know, it, this, it's just, it's just a, it's like um, if you had the choice of going to work in a factory or, uh, or in, a, in, a, in a forest, you know, so to speak, for your actual environment, um, on a rainy bad day, you might be a bit questionable, but, but your essential environment is that kind of concept within vineyards. If you're working in the vineyards, one is a factory. And you know, the whole idea is you're out there, that vine is going to produce grapes and you're doing everything to make it do its job. Or you, and, and it, it will be applying whatever chemicals, whatever to, to that vine. Whereas you, you go out into a vineyard that's um, organic biodynamic and the vine will be doing its job and you're in such a more attractive environment to be helping it along its way to do that. Who, who, uh, right, who, who, who is the designer of your webs, of the Puya website? That's Morven McCauley. She's, she runs, she has a little company called Tradecraft. She's, uh, she grew up on a vineyard further south, uh, one of uh, Otago's oldest Pinot vineyards. And um, she's actually a jeweler, trained jeweler by trade. And she made jewelry with Meadow Lark and all sorts of people. And um, she, um, is wonderfully creative and um, and she runs our social media as well. Yeah. She, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time on winery websites, hoping not to embarrass myself in these conversations by knowing a little bit more about the winery than I might otherwise know. So in the last year and a half, I've probably, you know, investigated carefully a hundred or so winery websites. Yours is the most enjoyable to read that I think I remember ever in my 48 year wine career. This woman who, who does, who's in charge of it, she must be like, have the best sense of humor, kind of a wry sense of humor. There's, there's, there's several, a lot of places in the website where I laughed out loud reading it. <laughs> But it wasn't like an overt joke. It was just something subtle in there that you went, that's hilarious that that just said that. I mean, one of the wine, one of the food pairings for the, I think it's for the Hunky Dory White, Tangle White is a hot dog. Um, yeah. You know, I, you just don't expect to have a hot dog recommended as a food pairing on a winery um, website. Well, that's true. We should, we should oops. Are we, we're looking at the table. Yeah, we should, we should talk about the hungry door horn. Yeah, but you see, she's lived in America. She's lived in a lot, like a lot of New Zealanders, we sort of travel. We've often lived all over the place yeah. for a bit of time and loves America. So, for, you know, um, probably more than she loves hot dogs. <laughs> 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 and um, so she's thought about the fact that we, you know, we do business um, in America and in the UK, and there's certain foods that are so American. Um, you know, hot dogs everywhere around the world are seen as an American food, whether they be that or not. Um, just like I think pies, meat pies, are probably seen as English. They're just things that have traveled around the world that stay in some nationality. But I think it's wonderful. It's a, a wonderful. Um, she's remembering pro uh, probably eating a New York hot dog. And uh, I think we talked about that. And um, because even though we have some 
of that hair is never the same. It's a bit like Greek yogurt. It's never the same. You've got to have it in situ. You've got to have it where it is and try and remember that flavor um, to take with you because it's, it's that they're here, but they don't taste the same. Well, there's, there's a hot dog here called a, a Chicago dog that has coleslaw and uh, mustard and a pickle slice on it. That would be really good. That's, that's probably it. I mean, I know that she's talking about um, a hot dog from, and she's been through, um, I know she lived in uh, the New York area and but certainly traveled through um, quite a lot of the states and she's been through Chicago as well. And um, well, I don't want to dwell too long on that, but your website is delightful. It is delightful. Yeah. What is Aotearoa? It's a Maori for, or Te Reo Maori, which is the indigenous language of the, um, I guess, second wave of people from the Pacific. The first, the Moriori. They, um, they also speak a version, but it's Te Reo Moriori. It's slightly different. Um, and so Te Reo Maori is sort of the becoming more and more of the indigenous national language, like our, um, our um, what do you call it, um, national anthem is sung in Maori first and then English second. Yeah. So there's work happening there all the time. So it means land of the long white cloud. It's New Zealand. It's it's the that's the translation of it. Because when the travellers were um, coming, it's you know the Pacific's an awfully large place. I'm quite sure a lot of people never got here, and um, it was seen as this as where the clouds collected, land of the long white cloud. Wow, that's beautiful. I'm so glad I asked that question. Um, but but I think, is her name Tiffany? No, her name is Morvin. Morvin, Morvin. I guess she just assumes that you're going to do the research to find out what these Maori words actually mean because they're interspersed all throughout the website. Um, it's interesting. Um, anyway, I, it's, it's, it's the best winery website I've ever. I, I remember spending time uh, investigating. Thank you. I would. It, it, I would it really tell that. made my she, morning because I, I probably I think I laughed out loud five or six times. Um, cool. So the hunky dory tangle white is a blend of five different grapes, I think. A Schooner Veltliner, Sauvignon Blanc, a Pinot Gris, Chardonnay, and Riesling, and. Um, we made a larger percentage of it being um, Gruner Veltliner. Um, yeah, that's this from the 2020, simply because, because of COVID, because it was such a lockdown, uh, we had no idea what was going to happen. And when times are tricky in the world, it tends to be that the um, immediately people drop back to just buying Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir and Chardonnay because you know everyone becomes conservative when faced with a bit of a challenge so I thought well okay let's just let's move the tangle into using some of the um, uh, Gruner Veltliner whereas normally we would have less Gruner Veltliner in this. And it's, it's, just, it's a, just such a lovely variety here. It's added such a nice character to the wine. Um, love these white summer blends. They're just gorgeous. And so picked and uh, fermented as each one came in, it would be ferment added to the ferment. And um, so for co-fermented seems to be a really great idea. It makes all of the varieties interlace together. So you don't have such a sort of a, a distance between each variety. And um, I think, yeah, I do. I'm a fan of, of white blends. They don't have to be wildly aromatic, but they just, I really like them when they're floral and um, lovely sort of dry on the palate, but not too austere. 
and they have, you know, it's got some Pinot Gris in there, which tends to make it a little bit more round and a bit of Chardonnay, which is all peach. And then the Riesling's just got a little bit of lime coming in there as well. Um, it's a really nice combination because the Gruner Veltliner has a floral aspect, but also a lovely nectarine and, um, and, and citrus base as well. You'll find most of Marlborough white wines, they always have citrus in their palate. You know, so if you're doing blind wine tastings, it's such a character of Marlborough white wines. There's always a, a bit of a lemon or a mandarin or a grapefruit or, or a lime lurking lime. in there somewhere. Mm. Kefir lime. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I love kefir lime. I think that's one of the most gorgeous flavors in, in the world. Do you know a winemaker, a South African winemaker named Evan Sadi? Do you know his wines? Uh, no, I don't, no. Um, he makes white blends. He has one wine called Palladius that's 11 different grapes. He, um, he, he explores in Swartland in South Africa and finds abandoned vineyards and cleans them up and gets them healthy again, and then just picks whatever's in the vineyard and bottles that as a wine. And he, his, I think he's one of the most brilliant winemakers in the world. He's very unusual, his wines are very unusual, but his wines are stagger, especially the whites are staggeringly interesting, complex, long lived, uh, extraordinary wines. And when I came to work here two years ago, I'd never heard of him. And now I think he's, he's, he's like, I, I bow down every time I walk past a bottle of his wine. Um, That's fantastic. That's great. Yeah. That's a love, wonderful concept. Um, but yeah, and so these blends, they are great fun and they, um, they just add another dimension to this kind of new world, simple one varietal concept of the white world. It seems that reds can blend, but whites have not been, it's not been so, such a, a rapid blending option there. But I think, are we a bit tight for time? Should I pull up the Pinot? We... Well, I was gonna make one more comment about the tangle white. Uh, you know, when I was reading about it, th this is a, has been an ongoing thread in this conversation. There, there used to be this amazing white wine, California white wine called Camus Conundrum. And there was a time when Camus Conundrum, the white Camus Conundrum was a really, really fabulous wine. Um, it had Gewürztraminer and Semillon in it. So it didn't really taste like this. It was a little sweeter, richer, but um, you know, then Camus, then Chuck Wagoner sold Camus and you know, the, the rest is history. The wines aren't what they once were. But in the, in, 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 although this wine doesn't really taste like Camus Conundrum, it reminds me of Camus Conundrum uh, as kind of a corroboration of your idea that white blends can be really, really uh, interesting, interesting wines like this one. This is special. Yeah. yeah, it's an interesting blend, interesting blend of varieties that all do really well here. Yeah. So Pinot Noir, New Zealand Pinot Noir. Here we go. So our Pinot Noir program, this is our 16. We um, hold our Huria Pinot for three years in the winery before we release it. So it's, you know, the grapes handpicked all of their usual business, um, Burgundy clones and, um, and some pomade planted in 1993 and Burgundy is planted in um, 95 and uh, 2000. So, um, 16 was a reasonably just an average year here, like perfectly nice, a little bit cloudier than 14, uh, but you know, temperate, uh, good weather, warm as per normal. And the grapes, they're all um, de-stemmed into tank. They, and they, there's really just one plunging tank and then the rest of them are just pumping over tanks. And we, we don't do any whole bunch or anything like that. We, want, we don't want any of the green characters to come in. So um, once it's fermented through and the cap starts to fall, we pull it, pull it out, press it off 
and um, then send it off, um, take it off to barrel where it lives in barrel for a year. And it's still got a little bit of its uh, fermentation happening initially, and then it goes to sleep for the winter and um, wakes up in the spring for a spontaneous malo. And that goes through until uh, just basically the end of March, we pull it out of the small barrels. It's, and these barrels, they, they're around 30% new. And we then put it into one of our large oak vats. We've got two 7,000s and one 11,000. So it usually fits into a 7,000 litre vat and a couple of big punchins neutral oak for another year. And when we used to bottle it after one year, the fruit was always there, but it was very simple, comparatively simple by giving it another year, because you know, like we don't find the whites. We stopped finding the whites in 2013. So they're all vegan. Basically they, 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 um, they only have a little bit of um, sulfur added before bottling. The Pinot, um, we stopped finding them with egg whites in 2010. And so they have no additives except a tiny, like, you know, a tiny bit of um, preservative just uh, at bottling. I think this is, this is a, was about um, 40 parts total. And um, so that's into the natural wine concept, but it's not, um, it's um, not going to go bubbly on you. <laughs> and the... yeah, I, I'd be, uh, Claire, I'd be careful about mentioning natural wines. <laughs> so, um, but it is I filtered. Mean, you can... <laughs> You can it make the filtered. wine naturally, and that's wonderful, but uh, I wouldn't want to call your wines natural wines because that implies something totally different that is... It certainly does. Yeah. It's, a, it's a wild place to be, I think. So, um, and so this then, with that second year in large oak, you get, you get that softening of the tannins and integration, and that's where you're getting that chocolate and, um, oh, cedar, and um, some of those uh, you know, salty, briny, tertiary aging flavors that make the wine so interesting and, and moorish. And then, um, and then after filtering, we um, bottling, we then hold it for another year in the bottle. So it's really integrated before we release it. And we don't make a huge amount of this it's sort of between 900 and 1200 cases total production a year but um when it's when it's released it's basically looking really good and they age beautifully you know that um we've got 2002s that are gorgeous um you know 2003 2005 i mean they age really really well so um it's just it's but they are just delicious. Like we, we, you know, this is a wonderful food wine as well. It's just um, amazing with pasta and amazing with tomato, which is so difficult to find wines that go, you know, we do, we make a lot of, sure you can do mushrooms, which is just you know, wonderful with this, but um, pasta with um olives and capers and tomato, it seems to sit so well with any of that. And um, it's quite the most delicious wine. It's so easy to drink. This I was, I was thinking Pino, that, I have to say. I was thinking that it would be really delicious with uh, Linguini Puttanesca. Yes. Yeah. 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 And then yeah. you said tomatoes and capers. Mm -hmm. um, so if 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 tomorrow somebody poured me a glass of this Pinot Noir in a blind tasting, I would. Well, if I was having a good day, I think I would know it was Pinot Noir. I think I would think it was a new world of Pinot Noir. So, and then I would think, well, it's a, it's a really high quality, new, a new world Pinot Noir. So that means it could be, uh, you know, Oregon, some parts of California, uh, Clare Valley, Australia, um, uh, Patagonia, increasingly these days, amazing wines from there, really amazing wines from there. Um, New Zealand, I think that they would be pretty much cover it, right? Well, I guess some parts of Canada. What, where would this, what, 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 if, what about this wine uh, identifies it as New Zealand Pinot Noir? What is the character, what is that characteristic? 
Ah, the characteristic. Well, um, the characteristic is that it's uh, grown and made here in New Zealand. <laughs> no, 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 no. I know that. <laughs> Was, I'm just teasing. It's a, it's a, it's a <laughs> that, that was really noir. mean. That was the, <laughs> I have done over a hundred of these tastings. That's the meanest thing anybody's ever said to me at one of these stations. I'm going to, I'm going to remember you for that. <laughs> well, it's true because you're asking about Pinot Noir. Um, to, to put it in context, in um, 2007, uh, I, I went up to do, I did the Pinot Noir event up in um, Oregon mm -hmm. and the Pinot Noir conference. We were invited up for that and we did a, 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 a dinner with, um, who was it with, uh, Izzy? Uh, yeah, so. Uh, Adelsheim? Adelsheim. So oh, I know. we had. Mike Adelsheim one of my close friends. So oh. we, we had the Pinot Gris and we had the Pinot Noir and it was meant to show the difference between New Zealand and the Willamette Valley and what it did was it showed how you can take Pinot and plant it in opposite ends of the world and it can taste like it came from the next door vineyard because that's the, the, the microclimate of Pinot and so it's so expressive of where it comes from. When it's made in a way like they do, um, where the wine expresses itself from the vineyard, this is not made like a winemaker's concept of what a Pinot should look like. This is made from the vineyard. So as all of our wines are, you know, we're not, I'm not, uh, we're not saying, um, well, we really like the style that is trendy at the moment, which might be 15% whole bunch and et cetera, et cetera. And that's what we think Pinot Noir should be like because we like so-and-so's Pinot Noir. We make the wine that comes off the vineyard and we express that vineyard. And when you do that, you actually see what the Tua is offering. And so when you say what makes it uniquely New Zealand, it's not, it's Pinot Noir. What makes it uniquely Pinot Noir is what this wine is. And it could just be from the next vineyard. In Oregon, it's so Willamette Valley, but you could say, well, Willamette Valley is so Marlborough. Um, that's the extraordinary thing about Pinot Noir. It's quite a magical grape, um, but a lot of Pinot Noirs are made in a winemaker's style. It's an overriding style. Um, we 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 don't have such a strong winemaking ego here. Um, we have a to our ego, so to speak. Yeah, uh, what I think, you know, I, I I I appreciate what you've said, and I applaud it and and respect it. But in a blind tasting, let's, let's assume that I'm sitting for the master sommelier exam tomorrow, and if I said this is a Pinot Noir, but it could be New Zealand or Willamette Valley. Yeah. Okay. I would fail. <laughs> so. Yes, you would. So that the wines are not so good. They often used our wines are used in the UK with our guys there as our kind of trick wines for. But the other thing that you can find in New Zealand and Marlborough and Otago Pinots in particular is there's often a little bit of it's it's a character a little bit like um, uh, wild thyme. It's just a, a, a right in there, a little bit of wild time, a little bit of on the edge of um, uh, f f farmyardy wild time character that you can see coming through in, in the New Zealand Pinots when they're not showing too much of that carbonic maceration because Otago does a lot of that whole bunch ferment. So you're getting that big nose, that big front fatness before quite a sort of, you know, a more of a crisp palate and that changes the wines. Um, but there's, that's something that I've, it's a, it's a kind of savory brininess that is not so apparent in the Willamette Valley. Yeah. Well, I've got some time growing in my garden. So when I get home tonight, I'm going to see, uh, see about that. You know, fats are uh, in California, fats are vineyards used to have a garden of wildflowers and herbs and they would pour you a glass of wine and you would wander through the garden and crush, you know, lemon verbena 
and smell your hands and then taste the wine and you would taste one thing and then you would wander along and crush lavender in your hand and smell your hand and taste the wine and you would taste something totally different. It was really one of the fascinating wine experiences I've, ha I've had in my life was just wandering through this garden and uh, experiencing the impact that the aroma of these flowers and herbs, yeah. 50 different things had on the taste of, of the same wine, how different the wine was just based on the smell on the hand. Yes, it is. It's, it's an extraordinary um, effect. And there is, um, it is a, it's, there seems to be an effect out in the vineyard with what you grow in between the vines and, and so on. Yeah, It's another whole area yet to be analyzed. Well, I mean, you know, I, I always say that wine is one of the most complex things in the world because everything that's in the air in the vineyard when you harvest the grapes ends up in the bottle. Yes, and with red wines, because whatever's on the skin of the berry uh, actually ferments into, into, you know, stays into the wine. Whereas with white wines, because they're pressed off, generally pressed off with very little skin contact, it doesn't adhere so much. But with red wines, if you, yeah, there's much greater environmental influence. One of the, one of the great, really great Napa Valley Cabernet's Heights Martha's Vineyard is well known for have a, having a strong presence of eucalyptus and mint in the, in the wine that you, it's really a, a powerful characteristic in the wine. And Joe Heights, it, he went crazy if you mentioned the eucalyptus in his wine. He was so offended by the idea that his wine smelled like, like eucalyptus. He would, he would really like completely lose it if somebody suggested that and go off in these rants with lots of profanity and, but there's <laughs> eucalyptus everywhere. There's, if you walk through the vineyard, you can smell the eucalyptus. There's eucalyptus trees everywhere around the Martha's Vineyard vineyard. Right. And it, so it ends up in the wine. I mean, it's just, but he refused to admit that it was present in the wine when every single other person in the world that ever tasted his wine smelled it. And look, that is the thing. Some people are, you know, some people have a nose for VA. Some people have a nose for Brettanomyces. Some people are really cork sensitive, cork TCA sensitive. And, um, uh, but no, I mean, that, that's a problem that people here have cut down eucalyptus, um, you know, trees because the influence on Pinot Noir, it's, you know, the influence is so strong and places like um, WA wines are wonderful, but often some of their reds can have a distinctive eucalyptus character because, well, well, that's the native tree. Well, you would, you really wouldn't want eucalyptus in your Pinot Noir. <laughs> it's, it's okay in no. Australia, Barossa Shiraz, and it's okay in, in uh, Heights, Martha's Vineyard Cabernet, but it would be a really a problem in this one. Um, yes. Well, this has been amazing. Uh, I, I, you know, I, again, I just love your wines. I've loved them for a long time. And uh, it, it's just, it's, a, it, it's kind of crazy to think that you can be in New Zealand and we can be here. And there hasn't been a sl the slightest little glitch in the, in the, in the uh, broadcast or whatever you call it. Um, it's like you're sitting in the same room with us. It's, it's, Kind of crazy. Um, That's so you fantastic. have really good Wi-Fi, I guess. I guess you have really good Wi-Fi. Well, we we actually don't. We have terrible Wi-Fi. I'm always impressed with America. Um, well, we are on the copper wire, but um, I, the modem is about um, sort of seven feet away from yeah. me. That so helps. that's really that's really helpful. Whereas, um, because this is a lot of metal in this um, winery just area, um, if I went about, um, I guess, 20 feet away, we, we would, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. So, I, 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 often, uh, I often ask this question to end these conversations. Um, and I'm not, I am not asking you what is the greatest wine you've ever tasted? Because I know what that is. It's this Pinot Noir we're drinking right now. <laughs> um, but would you share with us a, important ex wine experience moment from your life that really was special? 
Um, yes, it was uh, tasting the Domaine Le Fleuve, um, the flowers vineyard, uh, vineyard in, um, I guess the first time I tasted their wines was 1991. And I couldn't believe anything. I was in Burgundy. Um, I couldn't believe anything tasted like that. And then another time, I think it must have been the 2005 vintage um, at a tasting with a whole lot of winemakers here in Marlborough, it must have been about 40 of us. And all that anyone could say was, wow, why does anyone even bother compared to that? And so I think those wines are amazing. I think that she was amazing. And, um, and that's, the, that's, the, that's the hunt. That's a lot of the objective behind organics and biodynamics, apart from the environmental. I mean, we've been carbon neutral. We've done all of this environmental thing. Is that the wines, like Anne Gross wines, the wines that are organic and biodynamic, they are amazing. You know, they're the best wines I've ever tasted. And, um, and so when you're chasing excellence, you have to look at what people are doing when you regard that they are actually, they are excellent. You know, that, that conversation I had with Uncle LaFlave where she said that, you know, her vineyards, her vineyard workers were happier after she converted to biodynamics was in 2005. Yeah. And it was a tasting of her 2002s um, at a friend of mine's home in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, who has, who's one of the major wine, believe it or not, he's in Nashville. He's one of the major wine collectors in the world. Uh, but, but, and he, ho he agreed to host this event with me, but we tasted the, the gamut of her wines from the Macon Verze to the, through the Montrachet. And universally, the Creole Batar Montrachet that, that night was the best wine. It, it really stood out as the best wine in this tasting of her. I mean, the Macon Verze was one of the greatest wines you've ever tasted. And then you're getting ready to taste 10 other wines that are even better um, from a great Burgundy vintage. But, you know, the, the Creole just really stood out as the greatest wine. And uh, which is surprising because she's really known for the Chevalier Montrachet and the Montrachet. And, um, and so I asked her, I said, why is the, I mean, this wine is incredible tonight. It's just incredible. And she said, well, I knew it would be. And I said, really? She said, well, today's a leaf day. <laughs> <laughs> and the, on a leaf day, the Creole is always the best wine. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there you go. And I mean, that's biodynamics. That kind of sums up biodynamics. We had, we had a conversation with Jeremy Sace from Dujac maybe a year ago and I asked him because they're close friends with Romani with Obert of Lane at Romani County and I asked I said you know why is it that your best wine sells for six hundred dollars and his best wine sells for six thousand dollars his wine is not ten times better than yours and he Jeremy says just laughed at me he said you know I was there we were there a few months ago and we tasted their most recent vintage and we don't even, we can't even begin to understand what Aubert de Blaine is doing at Romani Conti. We don't make wines like that. We were completely humbled by the experience of tasting those wines. We don't, we don't even understand what he's doing. And this is the, own, the you know, the now owner of one of the most important wineries in Burgundy. And he thinks, you know, it's a, what Aubert de Blaine is doing is something totally different. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot to learn. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hoyt, I, I hate to be a bearer of bad news, but I've got Miss Claire booked and we have a Zoom starting in six minutes. Well, I oh. think this is a great time. I think that's just, a, this is a, a, a great time to, to stop. And uh, I, I want to thank you, Izzy, and thank you, Claire. Um, and Carrie, who's uh, not visible, thank you for your part in this too. And I'm so so sorry that Kate, for some reason, Kate Clausen, who's been selling your wines here for a long time, uh, 
apparently wasn't able to join us tonight and she had intended to, I don't know why she's not with us. I know she's, she's disappointed because she's uh, was looking forward to this a lot. Um, it's always nice when I taste wines that I've loved for a long time and I love them again. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. So it was lovely to meet Blair. you. Thank you, Izzy. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Have a wonderful weekend.